The French Revolution, A History. By Thomas Carlyle. 1837. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Book 1-7. The Insurrection of Women. Chapter 1.7.I. Patrolitism. No, friends, this revolution is not of the consolidating kind. Do not fires, fevers, sown seeds, chemical mixtures, men, events, all embodiments of force that work in this miraculous complex of forces, named universe, go on growing, through their natural phases and developments, each according to its kind, reach their height, reach their visible decline, finally sink under, ashing, and what we call die. They all grow, there is nothing but what grows, and shoots forth into its special expansion, once give it leave to spring. Observe too that each grows with a rapidity proportioned, in general, to the madness and unhealthiness there is in it, slow regular growth, though this also ends in death, is what we name health and sanity. A sanscolatism, which has prostrated Bastilles, which has got pike and musket, and now goes burning shadows, passing resolutions and haranguing under roof and sky, may be said to have sprung, and, by law of nature, must grow. To judge by the madness and diseasedness both of itself, and of the soil and element it is in, one might expect the rapidity and monstrosity would be extreme. Many things too, especially all diseased things, grow by shoots and fits. The first grand fit and shooting forth of Sanscolatism with that of Paris conquering its king, for Bailly's figure of rhetoric was all too sad a reality. The king is conquered, going at large on his parole, on condition, say, of absolutely good behavior, which, in these circumstances, will unhappily mean no behavior whatever. A quite untenable position, that of majesty put on its good behavior. Alas, is it not natural that whatever lives try to keep itself living? Whereupon his majesty's behavior will soon become exceptionable, and so the second grand fit of Sanscolatism, that of putting him in endurance, cannot be distant. Necker, in the National Assembly, is making moan, as usual about his deficit, barriers and custom houses burnt, the tax gatherer hunted, not hunting, his majesty's exchequer all but empty. The remedy is a loan of thirty millions, then, on still more enticing terms, a loan of eighty millions, neither of which loans, unhappily, will the stock jobbers venture to lend. The stock jobber has no country, except his own black pool of agio. And yet, in those days, for men that have a country, what a glow of patriotism burns in many a heart, penetrating inwards to the very purse. So early as the 7th of August, a dawn patriotic, a patriotic gift of jewels to a considerable extent, has been solemnly made by certain Parisian women, and solemnly accepted, with honourable mention. Whom forthwith all the world takes to imitating and emulating. Patriotic gifts, always with some heroic eloquence, which the President must answer and the Assembly listen to, flow in from far and near, in such number that the honourable mention can only be performed in lists published at stated epochs. Each gives what he can, the very cordwainers have behaved munificently, one landed proprietor gives a forest, fashionable society gives its shoe buckles, takes cheerfully to shoe ties. Unfortunate females give what they have amassed in loving. The smell of all cash, as Vespasian thought, is good. Beautiful, and yet inadequate. The clergy must be invited to melt their superfluous church plate, in the royal mint. Nay finally, a patriotic contribution, of the forcible sort, must be determined on, though unwillingly, let the fourth part of your declared yearly revenue, for this once only, be paid down, so shall a national assembly make the constitution, undistracted at least by insolvency. Their own wages, as settled on the 17th of August, are but 18 francs a day, each man, but the public service must have sinews, must have money. To appease the deficit, not to cobbler, or choke the deficit, if you or mortal could. For withal, as Mirabeau was heard saying, it is the deficit that saves us. Towards the end of August, our National Assembly in its constitutional labours, has got so far as the question of veto, shall Majesty have a veto on the national enactments, or not have a veto? What speeches were spoken, within doors and without, clear, and also passionate logic, imprecations, combinations, gone happily, for most part, to limbo. Through the cracked brain, and uncracked lungs of St. Harouge, the Palais Royal rebellows with veto. Journalism is busy, France rings with veto. I shall never forget, says Dumont, my going to Paris, one of these days, with Mirabeau, and the crowd of people we found waiting for his carriage, about Leger the bookseller's shop. They flung themselves before him, conjuring him with tears in their eyes not to suffer the veto absolue. They were in a frenzy, Monsieur le Comte, you are the people's father, you must save us, you must defend us against those villains who are bringing back despotism. If the king get this veto, what is the use of National Assembly? We are slaves, all is done. 
Friends, if the sky fall, there will be catching of larks. Mirabeau, adds Dumont, was eminent on such occasions, he answered vaguely, with a patrician imperturbability, and bound himself to nothing. Deputations go to the Hôtel de Ville, anonymous letters to aristocrats in the National Assembly, threatening that 15,000, or sometimes that 60,000, will march to illuminate you. The Paris districts are astir, petition signing, saint Harouche sets forth from the Palais Royal, with an escort of 1,500 individuals, to petition in person. Resolute, or seemingly so, is the tall shaggy Marquis, is the Café de Foy, but resolute also is Commandant General Lafayette. The streets are all beset by patrols, saint Harouche is stopped at the Barrière des Bonhommes, he may bellow like the bulls of Bation, but absolutely must return. The brethren of the Palais Royal circulate all night, and make motions, under the open canopy, all coffee houses being shut. Nevertheless Lafayette and the town hall do prevail, saint Harouge is thrown into prison, Vito Absolu adjusts itself into suspensive veto, prohibition not forever, but for a term of time, and this doom's clamor will grow silent, as the others have done. So far has consolidation prospered, though with difficulty, repressing the nether sans world, and the constitution shall be made. With difficulty, amid jubilee and scarcity, patriotic gifts, bakers' cues, abbe fauché harangues, with their amen of platoon musketry. Scipio Americanus has deserved thanks from the National Assembly in France. They offer him stipends and emoluments, to a handsome extent, all which stipends and emoluments he, covetous of far other blessedness than mere money, does, in his chivalrous way, without scruple, refuse. To the Parisian common man, meanwhile, one thing remains inconceivable, that now when the Bastille is down, and French liberty restored, grain should continue so dear. Our rights of man are voted, feudalism and all tyranny abolished, yet behold we stand in queue. Is it aristocrat for stallers, a court still bent on intrigues? Something is rotten, somewhere. And yet, alas, what to do? Lafayette, with his patrols prohibits everything, even complaint. Saint Harouge and other heroes of the veto lie endurance. People's friend Marat was seized, printers of patriotic journals are fettered and forbidden, the very hawkers cannot cry, till they get license, and leaden badges. Blue National Guards ruthlessly dissipate all groups, scour, with leveled bayonets, the Palais Royal itself. Pass, on your affairs, along the Rue Taran, the patrol, presenting his bayonet prize, to the left. Turn into the Rue Saint-Benoît, he cries, to the right. A judicious patriot, like Camille de Moulin, in this instance, is driven, for quietness' sake, to take the gutter. Oh much suffering people, our glorious revolution is evaporating in tricolor ceremonies, and complimentary harangues. Of which latter, as Lustelot accurately calculates, upwards of two thousand have been delivered within the last month, at the town hall alone. And our mouths, unfilled with bread, are to be shut, under penalties? The caricaturist promulgates his emblematic tablature, le patriotisme chassant le patriotism, patriotism driven out by patrolitism. Ruthless patrols, long superfine harangues, and scanty ale baked loaves, more like baked bath bricks, which produce an effect on the intestines. Where will this end? In consolidation. Chapter 1.72. Oh Richard, oh my king. For, alas, neither is the town hall itself without misgivings. The nether sans gulotic world has been suppressed hitherto, but then the upper court world. Symptoms there are that the Uy de Boeuf is rallying. More than once in the town hall sauna dream, often enough, from those outspoken baker's cues, has the wish uttered itself, oh that our restorer of French liberty were here, that he could see with his own eyes, not with the false eyes of queens and cabals, and his really good heart be enlightened. For falsehood still environs him, entreating Dukes de Guiche, with bodyguards, scouts of buoy, a new flight of intriguers, now that the old is flown. What else means this advent of the regiment to Flandre, entering Versailles, as we hear, on the 23rd of September, with two pieces of cannon? Did not the Versailles National Guard do duty at the Chateau? Had they not Swiss, hundred Swiss, Garda du Corps, bodyguards so called? Nay, it would seem, the number of bodyguards on duty has, by a maneuver, been doubled, the new relieving battalion of them arrived at its time, but the old relieved one does not depart. Actually, there runs a whisper through the best informed upper circles, or a nod still more potentous than whispering, of His Majesty's flying to Metz, of a bond, to stand by him therein, which has been signed by noblesse and clergy, to the incredible amount of thirty, or even of sixty thousand. Lafayette coldly whispers it, and coldly asseverates it, to Count Destain at the dinner table, and Destain, one of the bravest men, quakes to the core lest some lackey overhear it, and tumbles thoughtful, without sleep, all night. Regiment Flandre, 
as we said, is clearly arrived. His Majesty, they say, hesitates about sanctioning the 4th of August, makes observations, of chilling tenor, on the very rights of man. Likewise, may not all persons, the bakers cues themselves discern on the streets of Paris, the most astonishing number of officers on furlough, crosses of St. Louis, and such like? Some reckon from a thousand to twelve hundred. Officers of all uniforms, nay one uniform never before seen by eye, green faced with red. The tricolor cockade is not always visible, but what, in the name of heaven, may these black cockades, which some wear, foreshadow? Hunger wets everything, especially suspicion and indignation. Realities themselves, in this Paris, have grown unreal, preternatural. Phantasms once more stalk through the brain of hungry France. O ye laggards and dastards, cry shrill voices from the queues, if ye had the hearts of men, ye would take your pikes and second-hand firelocks, and look into it, not leave your wives and daughters to be starved, murdered, and worse. Peace, women. The heart of man is bitter and heavy, patriotism, driven out by patrolitism, knows not what to resolve on. The truth is, the Uy de Boeuf has rallied, to a certain unknown extent. A changed Uy de Boeuf, with Versailles National Guards, in their tricolor cockades, doing duty there, a court all flaring with tricolor. Yet even to a tricolor court men will rally. Ye loyal hearts, burnt out seigneurs, rally round your queen. With wishes, which will produce hopes, which will produce attempts. For indeed self-preservation being such a law of nature, what can a rallied court do, but attempt an endeavor, or call it plot, with such wisdom and unwisdom as it has? They will fly, escorted, to Metz, where brave buoy commands, they will raise the royal standard, the bond signatures shall become armed men. Were not the king so languid. Their bond, if at all signed, must be signed without his privity. Unhappy king, he has but one resolution, not to have a civil war. For the rest, he still hunts, having ceased lockmaking, he still dozes, and digests, is clay in the hands of the potter. Ill will it fare with him, in a world where all is helping itself, where, as has been written, whosoever is not hammer must be stithy, and the very hiss upon the wall grows there, in that chink, because the whole universe could not prevent its growing. But as for the coming up of this regiment to Flandre, may it not be urged that there were St. Harouge petitions, and continual meal mobs. Undebauched soldiers, be their plot, or only dim elements of a plot, are always good. Did not the Versailles municipality, an old monarchic one, not yet refounded into a democratic, instantly second the proposal? Nay the very Versailles National Guard, wearied with continual duty at the chateau, did not object, only Draper Lee Coiner, who is now Major Lee Coiner, shook his head. Yes, friends, surely it was natural this regiment to Flandre should be sent for, since it could be got. It was natural that, at sight of military bandoliers, the heart of the rallied Uy de Boeuf should revive, and maids of honour, and gentlemen of honour, speak comfortable words to epauletted defenders, and to one another. Natural also, and mere common civility, that the bodyguards, a regiment of gentlemen, should invite their Flandre brethren to a dinner of welcome. Such invitation, in the last days of September, is given and accepted. Dinners are defined as the ultimate act of communion, men that can have communion and nothing else, can sympathetically eat together, can still rise into some glow of brotherhood over food and wine. The dinner is fixed on, for Thursday the 1st of October, and ought to have a fine effect. Further, as such dinner may be rather extensive, and even the non-commission and the common man be introduced, to see and to hear, could not His Majesty's Opera Apartment, which has lain quite silent ever since Kaiser Joseph was here, be obtained for the purpose? The hall of the opera is granted, the Salon Turcule shall be drawing room. Not only the officers of Flandre, but of the Swiss, of the Hundred Swiss, nay of the Versailles National Guard, such of them as have any loyalty, shall feast, it will be a repast like few. And now suppose this repast, the solid part of it, transacted, and the first bottle over. Suppose the customary loyal toast drunk, the king's health, the queen's with deafening vivats, that of the nation omitted, or even rejected. Suppose champagne flowing, with pot valorous speech, with instrumental music, empty feathered heads growing ever the noisier, in their own emptiness, in each other's noise. Her Majesty, who looks unusually sad tonight, His Majesty sitting dulled with the day's hunting, is told that the sight of it would cheer her. Behold! She enters there, issuing from her state rooms, like the moon from the clouds, this fairest unhappy queen of hearts, royal husband by her side, young dauphin in her arms. She descends from the boxes, amid splendor and acclaim, walks queen-like, round the tables, gracefully escorted, gracefully nodding, her looks full of sorrow, yet of gratitude and daring, with the hope of France on her mother bosom. And now, the band striking up, 
O Richard, O Mon Roi, Luniver to Bandon, O Richard, O my King, and world is all forsaking thee, could man do other than rise to height of pity, of loyal valor? Could feather headed young ensigns do other than, by white bourbon cockades, handed them from fair fingers, by waving of swords, drawn to pledge the Queen's health, by trampling of national cockades, by scaling the boxes, whence intrusive murmurs may come, by vociferation, tripudiation, sound, fury, and distraction, within doors and without, testify what tempest toast state of vacuity they are in. Till champagne and tripudiation do their work, and all lie silent, horizontal, passively slumbering, with meat of battle dreams. A natural repast, in ordinary times, a harmless one, now fatal, as that of Thyestes, as that of Job's sons, when a strong wind smote the four corners of their banquet house. Poor ill-advised Marie Antoinette, with a woman's vehemence, not with a sovereign's foresight. It was so natural, yet so unwise. Next day, in public speech of ceremony, Her Majesty declares herself delighted with the Thursday. The heart of the Uy de Boeuf glows into hope, into daring, which is premature. Rallied maids of honor, waited on by abbess, so white cockades, distribute them with words, with glances, to uplighted youths, who in return, may kiss, not without fervor, the fair sewing fingers. Captains of horse and foot go swashing with enormous white cockades, nay one Versailles national captain had mounted the like, so witching were the words and glances, and laid aside his tricolor. Well may Major Lecointer shake his head with a look of severity, and speak audible resentful words. But now a swashbuckler, with enormous white cockade, overhearing the major, invites him insolently, once and then again elsewhere, to recant, and failing that, to duel. Which latter feat Major Lecointer declares that he will not perform, not at least by any known laws of fence, that he nevertheless will, according to mere law of nature, by dirk and blade, exterminate any vile gladiator, who may insult him or the nation, whereupon, for the major is actually drawing his implement, they are parted, and no wesen slit. Chapter 1.73. Black Cuckades. But fancy what effect this Thyestes repast and trampling on the national cockade, must have had in the Salle des Menus, in the famishing baker's queues at Paris. Nay such Thyestes repasts, it would seem, continue. Flandre has given its counter-dinner to the Swiss and hundred Swiss, then on Saturday there has been another. Yes, here with us is famine, but yonder at Versailles is food, enough and to spare. Patriotism stands in queue, shivering hunger-struck, insulted by patrolitism, while bloody-minded aristocrats, heated with excess of high living, trample on the national cockade. Can the atrocity be true? Nay, look, green uniforms faced with red, black cockades, the color of night. Are we to have military onfall, and death also by starvation? For behold the Corbet cornboat, which used to come twice a day, with its plaster of Paris meal, now comes only once. And the town hall is deaf, and the men are laggard and dastard. At the Café de Foy, this Saturday evening, a new thing is seen, not the last of its kind, a woman engaged in public speaking. Her poor man, she says, was put to silence by his district, their presidents and officials would not let him speak. Wherefore she here with her shrill tongue will speak, denouncing, while her breath endures, the corbet boat, the plaster of Paris bread, sacrilegious opera dinners, green uniforms, pirate aristocrats, and those black cockades of theirs. Truly, it is time for the black cockades at least, to vanish. Then patrolitism itself will not protect. Nay, sharp-tempered M. Tassin, at the Tuileries parade on Sunday morning, forgets all national military rule, starts from the ranks, wrenches down one black cockade which is swashing ominous there, and tramples it fiercely into the soil of France. Patrolitism itself is not without suppressed fury. Also the districts begin to stir, the voice of President Danton reverberates in the Cordeliers, people's friend Marat has flown to Versailles and back again, swart bird, not of the halcyon kind. And so Patriot meets promenading Patriot, this Sunday, and sees his own grim care reflected on the face of another. Groups, in spite of patrolitism, which is not so alert as usual, fluctuate deliberative, groups on the bridges, on the quay, at the patriotic cafes. And ever as any black cockade may emerge, rises the many-voiced growl and bark, ah boss, down. All black cockades are ruthlessly plucked off, one individual picks his up again, kisses it, attempts to refix it, but a hundred canes start into the air, and he desists. Still worse when it with another individual, doomed, by extempore plebiscitum, to the lanterne, saved, with difficulty, by some active corps de garde. Lafayette sees signs of an effervescence, which he doubles his patrols, doubles his diligence, to prevent. So passes Sunday, the 4th of October 1789. Sullen is the male heart, repressed by patrolitism, 
Beaman is the female, irrepressible. The public speaking woman at the Palais Royal was not the only speaking one, men know not what the pantry is, when it grows empty, only house mothers know. O oh, women, wives of men that will only calculate and not act. Patrolitism is strong, but death, by starvation and military onfall, is stronger. Patrolitism represses male patriotism, but female patriotism? Will guards name national thrust their bayonets into the bosoms of women? Such thought, or rather such dim unshaped raw material of a thought, ferments universally under the female nightcap, and, by earliest daybreak, on slight hint, will explode. Chapter 1.74. The Manettes. If Voltaire once, in splenetic humor, asked his countrymen, but you, Walches, what have you invented? They can now answer, the art of insurrection. It was an art needed in these last singular times, an art, for which the French nature, so full of vehemence, so free from depth, was perhaps of all others the fittest. Accordingly, to what a height, one may well say of perfection, has this branch of human industry been carried by France, within the last half-century. Insurrection, which, Lafayette thought, might be the most sacred of duties, ranks now, for the French people, among the duties which they can perform. Other mobs are dull masses, which roll onwards with a dull fierce tenacity, a dull fierce heat, but emit no light flashes of genius as they go. The French mob, again, is among the liveliest phenomena of our world. So rapid, audacious, so clear-sighted, inventive, prompt to seize the moment, instinct with life to its finger ends. That talent, were there no other, of spontaneously standing in queue, distinguishes, as we said, the French people from all peoples, ancient and modern. Let the reader confess to that, taking one thing with another, perhaps few terrestrial appearances are better worth considering than mobs. Your mob is a genuine outburst of nature, issuing from, or communicating with, the deepest deep of nature. When so much goes grinning and grimacing as a lifeless formality, and under the stiff buckram no heart can be felt beating, here once more, if nowhere else, is a sincerity and reality. Shudder at it, or even shriek over it, if thou must, nevertheless consider it. Such a complex of human forces and individualities hurled forth, in their transcendental mood, to act and react, on circumstances and on one another, to work out what it is in them to work. The thing they will do is known to no man, least of all to themselves. It is the inflammablest immeasurable firework, generating, consuming itself. With what phases, to what extent, with what results it will burn off, philosophy and perspicacity conjecture in vain. Man, as has been written, is forever interesting to man, nay properly there is nothing else interesting. In which light also, may we not discern why most battles have become so wearisome? Battles, in these ages, are transacted by mechanism, with the slightest possible development of human individuality or spontaneity, men now even die, and kill one another, in an artificial manner. Battles ever since Homer's time, when they were fighting mobs, have mostly ceased to be worth looking at, worth reading of, or remembering. How many wearisome bloody battles does history strive to represent? or even, in a husky way, to sing, and she would omit or carelessly slur over this one insurrection of women? A thought, or dim raw material of a thought, was fermenting all night, universally in the female head, and might explode. In squalid garret, on Monday morning, maternity awakes, to hear children weeping for bread. Maternity must forth to the streets, to the herb markets and bakers, queues, meets there with hunger-stricken maternity, sympathetic, exasperative. Oh we unhappy women! But, instead of bakers' queues, why not to aristocrats' palaces, the root of the matter? Alons. Let us assemble. To the Hotel de Ville, to Versailles, to the Lanterne. In one of the guardhouses of the Cartier Saint Eustache, a young woman seizes a drum for how shall national guards give fire on women, on a young woman? The young woman seizes the drum, sets forth, beating it, uttering cries relative to the dearth of grains. Descend, O mothers, descend, ye Judiths, to food and revenge. All women gather and go, crowd storm all stairs, force out all women, the female insurrectionary force, according to Camille, resembles the English naval one, there is a universal press of women. Robust dames of the Halley, slim mantua makers, assiduous, risen with the dawn, ancient virginity tripping to maddens, the housemaid, with early broom, all must go. Rouse ye, O women, the laggard men will not act, they say, we ourselves may act. And so, like snowbreak from the mountains, for every staircase is a melted brook, it storms, tumultuous, wild shrilling, towards the Hôtel de Ville. Tumultuous, with or without drum music, for the Faubourg Saint-Antoine also has tucked up its gown, and, with besom staves, fire irons, and even rusty pistols, 
void of ammunition, is flowing on. Sound of it flies, with a velocity of sound, to the outmost barriers. By seven o'clock, on this raw October morning, fifth of the month, the town hall will see wonders. Nay, as chance would have it, a male party are already there, clustering tumultuously round some national patrol, and a baker who has been seized with short weights. They are there, and have even lowered the rope of the lantern. So that the official persons have to smuggle forth the short weighing baker by back doors, and even send to all the districts for more force. Grand it was, says Camille, to see so many Judiths, from eight to ten thousand of them in all, rushing out to search into the root of the matter. Not unfrightful it must have been, ludicro terrific, and most unmanageable. At such hour the overwatched three hundred are not yet stirring, none but some clerks, a company of national guards, and M. de Gouvian, the major general. Gouvian has fought in America for the cause of civil liberty, a man of no inconsiderable heart, but deficient in head. He is, for the moment, in his back apartment, assuaging Usher Maillard, the Bastille sergeant, who has come, as too many do, with representations. The assuagement is still incomplete when our Judiths arrive. The National Guards form on the outer stairs, with leveled bayonets, the 10,000 Judiths press up, resistless, with obtestations, with outspread hands, merely to speak to the mayor. The rear forces them, nay, from male hands in the rear, stones already fly, the National Guards must do one of two things, sweep the place to grev with cannon, or else open to right and left. They open, the living deluge rushes in. Through all rooms and cabinets, upwards to the topmost belfry, ravenous, seeking arms, seeking mayors, seeking justice, while, again, the better crest, dressed. Speak kindly to the clerks, point out the misery of these poor women, also their ailments, some even of an interesting sort. Poor M. De Gouvian is shiftless in this extremity, a man shiftless, perturbed, who will one day commit suicide. How happy for him that Usher Maillard, the shifty, was there, at the moment, though making representations. Fly back, thou shifty Maillard, seek the Bastille company, and O oh, return fast with it, above all, with thy own shifty head. For, behold, the Judiths can find no mayor or municipal. Scarcely, in the topmost belfry, can they find poor Abbe Lefebvre the powder distributor. Him, for one of a better, they suspend there, in the pale morning light, over the top of all Paris, which swims in one's failing eyes, a horrible end. Nay, the rope broke, as French ropes often did, or else an Amazon cut it. Abbe Lefebvre falls, some twenty feet, rattling among the leads, and lives long years after, though always with a tremblement in the limbs. And now doors fly under hatchets, the Judiths have broken the armory, have seized guns and cannons, three money bags, paper heaps, torches flare, in few minutes, our brave Hotel de Ville which dates from the fourth Henry, will, with all that it holds, be in flames. Chapter 1.7.V. Usher Mayar. In flames, truly, were it not that Usher Mayar, swift of foot, shifty of head, has returned. Maillard, of his own motion, for Gouvian or the rest would not even sanction him, snatches a drum, descends the porch stairs, ran tan, beating sharp, with loud rolls, his rogues march, to Versailles. Alons, a Versailles. As men beat on kettle or warming pond, when angry she bees, or say, flying desperate wasps, are to be hived, and the desperate insects hear it, and cluster round it, simply as round a guidance, where there was none, so now these menads round shifty Maillard, riding usher of the shot lay. The axe pauses uplifted, Abbe Lefebvre is left half-hanged, from the belfry downwards all vomits itself. What rub dub is that? Stanislas Maillard, Bastille hero, will lead us to Versailles? Joy to thee, Maillard, blessed art thou above riding ushers. Away then, away. The seized cannon are yoked with seized cart horses, brown locked Demoiselle Thoroin, with pike and helmet, sits there as gunnerous, with haughty eye and serene fair countenance, comparable, some think to the maid of Orléans, or even recalling the idea of Pallas Athene. Maillard, for his drum still rolls, is, by heaven-rending acclamation, admitted general. Maillard hastens the languid march. Maillard, beating rhythmic, with sharp rantan, all along the quay, leads forward, with difficulty his monadic host. Such a host, marched not in silence. The bargeman pauses on the river, all wagoners and coach drivers fly, men peer from windows, not women, lest they be pressed sight of sights, backants, in these ultimate formalized ages. Bronze Henri looks on, from his pawn neuf, the monarchic Louvre, Medici and Tuileries see a day not there to foreseen. And now Maillard has his menads in the Champs-Élysées, Fields Tartarian rather, and the Hôtel de Ville has suffered comparatively nothing. Broken doors, an Abbé Lefebvre, 
who shall never more distribute powder, three sacks of money, most part of which, for sense gulatism, though famishing, is not without honor, shall be returned, this is all the damage. Great Maillard. A small nucleus of order is round his drum, but his outskirts fluctuate like the mad ocean, for rascality male and female is flowing in on him from the four winds, guidance there is none but in his single head and two drumsticks. Oh my yar, when, since war first was, had general of force such a task before him, as thou this day? Walter the penniless still touches the feeling heart, but then Walter had sanction, had space to turn in, and also his crusaders were of the male sex. Thou, this day, is son of heaven and earth, art general of monads. Their inarticulate frenzy thou must on the spur of the instant, render into articulate words, into actions that are not frantic. Fail in it, this way or that. Pragmatical officiality, with its penalties and law books, waits before thee, monad storm behind. If such hewed off the melodious head of Orpheus, and hurled it into the Peneus waters, what may they not make of thee, the rhythmic merely, with no music but a sheepskin drum? Maillard did not fail. Remarkable Maillard, if fame were not an accident, and history a distillation of rumour, how remarkable wert thou! On the Elysian fields, there is pause and fluctuation, but, for Maillard, no return. He persuades his monads, clamorous for arms in the arsenal, that no arms are in the arsenal, that an unarmed attitude, and petition to a national assembly, will be the best, he hastily nominates or sanctions generalises, captains of tens and fifties, and so, in loosest flowing order, to the rhythm of some eight drums, having laid aside his own, with the Bastille volunteers bringing up his rear, once more takes the road. Shio, which will promptly yield baked loaves, is not plundered, nor are the Sevres potteries broken. The old arches of Sevres Bridge echo under monadic feet, Seine River gushes on with his perpetual murmur, and Paris flings after us the boom of toxin and alarm drum, inaudible, for the present, amid shrill-sounding hosts, and the splash of rainy weather. To Modon, to Saint Cloud, on both hands, the report of them is gone abroad, and hearths, this evening, will have a topic. The press of women still continues, for it is the cause of all Eve's daughters, mothers that are, or that hope to be. No carriage lady, were it with never such hysterics, but must dismount, in the mud roads, in her silk shoes, and walk. In this manner, amid wild October weather, they a wild unwinged stork flight, through the astonished country, when their way. Travellers of all sorts they stop, especially travellers or couriers from Paris. Deputy Le Chapelier, in his elegant vesture, from his elegant vehicle, looks forth amazed through his spectacles, apprehensive for life, states eagerly that he is patriot Deputy Le Chapelier, and even old President Le Chapelier, who presided on the night of Pentecost, and is original member of the Breton Club. Thereupon rises huge shout of Vive Le Chapelier, and several armed persons spring up behind and before to escort him. Nevertheless, news, dispatches from Lafayette, or vague noise of rumour, have pierced through, by side roads. In the National Assembly, while all is busy discussing the order of the day, regretting that there should be anti-national repasts in opera halls, that His Majesty should still hesitate about accepting the rights of man, and hang conditions and peradventures on them, Mirabeau steps up to the President, experienced Meunier as a chance to be, and articulates, in base undertone, Meunier, Paris marche sur nous, Paris is marching on us. Maybe, J. non rien. Believe it or disbelieve it, that is not my concern, but Paris, I say, is marching on us. Fall suddenly unwell, go over to the chateau, tell them this. There is not a moment to lose. Paris marching on us? Responds Meunier, with an atrabiliar accent, well, so much the better. We shall the sooner be a republic. Mirabeau quits him, as one quits an experienced president getting blindfold into deep waters, and the order of the day continues as before. Yes, Paris is marching on us, and more than the women of Paris. Scarcely was my yard gone, when M. de Gouvian's message to all the districts, and such toxin and drumming of the general, began to take effect. Armed national guards from every district, especially the grenadiers of the centre, who are our old guard of Frances, arrive, in quick sequence, on the place de Greve. An immense people is there, Saint Antoine, with pike and rusty firelock, is all crowding thither, be it welcome or unwelcome. The centre grenadiers are received with cheering, it is not cheers that we want, answer they gloomily, the nation has been insulted, to arms, and come with us for orders. Ha! Sits the wind so? Patriotism and patrolitism are now one. The three hundred have assembled, all the committees are in activity, Lafayette is dictating dispatches for Versailles, when a deputation of the centre grenadiers introduces itself to him. The deputation makes military obeisance, and thus speaks, not without a kind of thought in it, 
Mon General, we are deputed by the six companies of grenadiers. We do not think you a traitor, but we think the government betrays you, it is time that this end. We cannot turn our bayonets against women crying to us for bread. The people are miserable, the source of the mischief is at Versailles, we must go seek the king, and bring him to Paris. We must exterminate, exterminer, the regiment de Flandre and the Garda du Corps, who have dared to trample on the national cockade. If the king be too weak to wear his crown, let him lay it down. You will crown his son, you will name a council of regency, and all will go better. Reproachful astonishment paints itself on the face of Lafayette, speaks itself from his eloquent chivalrous lips, in vain. My general, we would shed the last drop of our blood for you, but the root of the mischief is at Versailles, we must go and bring the king to Paris, all the people wish it, tell the Pope Laveau. My general descends to the outer staircase, and harangues, once more in vain. To Versailles. To Versailles. Mayor Bailly, sent for through floods of sans attempts academic oratory from his gilt state coach, realizes nothing but infinite hoarse cries of, bread? To Versailles exclamation mark and gladly shrinks within doors. Lafayette mounts the white charger, and again harangues and reharangues, with eloquence, with firmness, indignant demonstration, with all things but persuasion. To Versailles. To Versailles. So lasts it, hour after hour, for the space of half a day. The great Scipio Americanus can do nothing, not so much as escape. More blue, moan general, cry the grenadiers serrying their ranks as the white charger makes a motion that way, you will not leave us, you will abide with us. A perilous juncture, mayor by E and the municipal sit quaking within doors, my general is prisoner without, the place de greffe, with its thirty thousand regulars, its whole irregular Saint Antoine and Saint Marceau, is one minatory mass of clear or rusty steel, all hearts set, with a moody fixedness, on one object. Moody, fixed are all hearts, tranquil is no heart, if it be not that of the white charger, who paws there, with arched neck, composedly champing his bit, as if no world, with its dynasties and eras, were now rushing down. The drizzly day tends westward, the cry is still, to Versailles. Nay now, born from afar, come quite sinister cries, hoarse, reverberating in long-drawn hollow murmurs, with syllables too like those of Lanterne. Or else, Irregular sanscolatism may be marching off, of itself, with pikes, nay with cannon. The inflexible Scipio does at length, by aide de camp, ask of the municipals, whether or not he may go. A letter is handed out to him, over armed heads, sixty thousand faces flash fixedly on his, there is stillness and no bosom breathes, till he have read. By heaven, he grows suddenly pale. Do the municipals permit? Permit and even order, since he can no other. Clangor of approval rends the welkin. To your ranks, then, let us march. It is, as we compute, towards three in the afternoon. Indignant National Guards may dine for once from their haversack, dined or undined, they march with one heart. Paris flings up her windows, claps hands, as the Avengers, with their shrilling drums and shams tramp by, she will then sit pensive, apprehensive, and pass rather a sleepless night. On the white charger, Lafayette, in the slowest possible manner, going and coming, and eloquently haranguing among the ranks, rolls onward with his thirty thousand. Saint Antoine, with pike and cannon, has preceded him, a mixed multitude, of all and of no arms, hovers on his flanks and skirts, the country once more pauses agape, Paris marche sur nous. Chapter 1.7.Vi. To Versailles. For, indeed, about this same moment, Maillard has halted his draggled menads on the last hilltop, and now Versailles, and the Chateau of Versailles, and far and wide the inheritance of royalty opens to the wondering eye. From far on the right, over Marley and St. Germain's and Lay, round towards Rambouillet, on the left, beautiful all, softly embosomed, as if in sadness, in the dim moist weather. And near before us is Versailles, new and old, with that broad front and avenue to Versailles between, stately front and broad, three hundred feet as men reckon, with four rows of elms, and then the Chateau de Versailles, ending in royal parks and pleasances, gleaming lakelets, harbours, labyrinths, the menagerie, and great and little Trianon high-towered dwellings, leafy pleasant places, where the gods of this lower world abide, whence, nevertheless, black care cannot be excluded, whither monadic hunger is even now advancing, armed with pike thyrsi. Yes, yonder, Maydam, where our straight front and avenue, joined, as you note, by two front and brother avenues from this hand and from that, spreads out into place royal and palace forecourt, yonder is the Salle des Menus. Yonder an august assembly sits regenerating France. Forecourt, Grand Court, Court of Marble, Court narrowing into Court you may discern next, or fancy, on the extreme verge of which the glass dome, 
visibly glittering like a star of hope, is the, Louis de Boeuf. Yonder, or nowhere in the world, is bread baked for us. But, O oh Madame, were not one thing good, that our cannons, with Demoiselle Theroyne and all show of war, be put to the rear? Submission beseems petitioners of a national assembly, we are strangers in Versailles, whence, too audibly, there comes even now sound as of toxin and general. Also to put on, if possible, a cheerful countenance, hiding our sorrows, and even to sing? Sorrow, pity to the heavens, is hateful, suspicious to the earth. So counsels shifty Maillard, haranguing his menads, on the heights near Versailles. Cunning Maillard's dispositions are obeyed. The draggled insurrectionists advance up the avenue, in three columns, among the four elm rows, singing on Riquetra, with what melody they can, and shouting Vive la ROI. Versailles, though the elm rows are dripping wet, crowds from both sides, with, Vive nos Parisiennes, our Paris once forever. Prickers, scouts have been out towards Paris, as the rumour deepened, whereby His Majesty, gone to shoot in the woods of Modon, has been happily discovered, and got home, and the General and Toxin set a sounding. The bodyguards are already drawn up in front of the palace grates, and look down the avenue de Versailles, sulky, in wet buckskins. Flandre too is there, repentant of the opera repast. Also dragoons dismounted are there. Finally Major Lee Coiner, and what he can gather of the Versailles National Guard, though, it is to be observed, our colonel, that same sleepless Count Disdain, giving neither order nor ammunition, has vanished most improperly, one supposes, into the Uy de Boeuf. Red-coated Swiss stand within the grates, under arms. There likewise, in their inner room, all the ministers, Saint Priest, Lamentation Pompignan and the rest, are assembled with M. Necker, they sit with him there, blank, expecting what the hour will bring. President Mounier, though he answered Mirabeau with a tantmew, and affected to slight the matter, had his own forebodings. Surely, for these four weary hours, he has reclined not on roses. The order of the day is getting forward, a deputation to His Majesty seems proper, that it might please him to grant acceptance pure and simple to those Constitution articles of ours, the mixed qualified acceptance, with its peradventures, is satisfactory to neither gods nor men. So much is clear. And yet there is more, which no man speaks, which all men now vaguely understand. Disquietude, absence of mind is on every face, members whisper, uneasily come and go, the order of the day is evidently not the day's one. Till at length, from the outer gates, is heard a rustling and jostling, shrill uproar and squabbling, muffled by walls, which testifies that the hour is come. Rushing and crushing one hears now, then enter Usher Mayar, with a deputation of fifteen muddy dripping women, having by incredible industry, and eight of all the massers, persuaded the rest to wait out of doors. National Assembly shall now, therefore, look its august task directly in the face, regenerative constitutionalism has an unregenerate sanscalatism bodily in front of it, crying bread. Bread. Shifty Maillard, translating frenzy into articulation, repressive with the one hand, expostulative with the other, does his best, and really, though not bred to public speaking, manages rather well, in the present dreadful rarity of grains, a deputation of female citizens has, as the August Assembly can discern, come out from Paris to petition. Plots of aristocrats are too evident in the matter. For example, one miller has been bribed by a banknote of 200 livres not to grind, name unknown to the usher, but fact provable, at least indubitable. Further, it seems, the national cockade has been trampled on, also there are black cockades, or were. All which things will not an August National Assembly, the hope of France, take into its wise immediate consideration? And monadic hunger, impressible, crying black cockades, crying bread, bread, adds, after such fashion, will it not? Yes, messieurs, if a deputation to His Majesty, for the acceptance pure and simple, seemed proper, how much more now, for the afflicting situation of Paris, for the calming of this effervescence? President Mounier, with a speedy deputation, among whom we notice the respectable figure of Dr. Guillotin, gets himself forthwith on march. Vice President shall continue the order of the day, Usher Maillard shall stay by him to repress the women. It is four o'clock, of the miserablest afternoon, when Mounier steps out. Oh experienced Mounier, what an afternoon, the last of thy political existence. Better had it been to fall suddenly unwell, while it was yet time. For, behold, the esplanade, over all its spacious expanse, is covered with groups of squalid dripping women, of lank-haired male rascality, armed with axes, rusty pikes, old muskets, iron-shot clubs, batons ferris, which end in knives or sword blades, a kind of extempore billhook, looking nothing but hungry revolt. The rain pours, 
Garda du corps go caracoling through the groups amid hisses, irritating and agitating what is but dispersed here to reunite there. Innumerable squalid women beleaguer the president and deputation, insist on going with him, has not his majesty himself, looking from the window, sent out to ask, what we wanted. Bread and speech with the king, du pain, et parlor oroi, that was the answer. Twelve women are clamorously added to the deputation, and march with it, across the esplanade, through dissipated groups, caracoling bodyguards, and the pouring rain. President Mounier, unexpectedly augmented by twelve women, copiously escorted by hunger and rascality, is himself mistaken for a group, himself and his women are dispersed by caracolers, rally again with difficulty, among the mud. Finally the grates are opened, the deputation gets access, with the twelve women two in it, of which latter, five shall even see the face of his majesty. Let wit menadism, in the best spirits it can expect their return. Chapter 1.77. At Versailles. But already Pallas Athene, in the shape of Demoiselle Theroyne, is busy with Flandre and the dismounted dragoons. She, and such women as are fittest, go through the ranks, speak with an earnest jocosity, clasp rough troopers to their patriot bosom, crush down spontoons and musketoons with soft arms, can a man, that were worthy of the name of man, attack famishing patriot women? One reads that Thoroin had bags of money, which she distributed over Flandre, furnished by whom? Alas, with money bags one seldom sits on insurrectionary cannon. Calumnious royalism. Theroyne had only the limited earnings of her profession of unfortunate female, money she had not, but brown locks, the figure of a heathen goddess, and an eloquent tongue and heart. Meanwhile, Saint Antoine, in groups and troops, is continually arriving, wetted, sulky, with pikes and impromptu billhooks, driven thus far by popular fixed idea. So many hirsute figures driven hither, in that manner, figures that have come to do they know not what, figures that have come to see it done. Distinguished among all figures, who is this, of gaunt stature, with leaden breastplate, though a small one, bushy and red grizzled locks, nay, with long tile beard? It is Jordan, unjust dealer in mules, a dealer no longer, but a painter's lay figure, playing truant this day. From the necessities of art comes his long tile beard, whence his leaden breastplate, unless indeed he were some hawker licensed by leaden badge, may have come, will perhaps remain forever a historical problem. Another Saul among the people we discern, Père Adam, Father Adam, as the groups name him, to us better known as bull-voiced Marquis saint Harouge, hero of the veto, a man that has had losses, and deserved them. The tall Marquis, emitted some days ago from limbo, looks peripatetically on this scene, from under his umbrella, not without interest. All which persons and things, hurled together as we see, Pallas Athene, busy with Flandre, patriotic Versailles National Guards, short of ammunition, and deserted by disdain their colonel, and commanded by Lee Coiner their major, then caracoling bodyguards, sour, dispirited, with their buckskins wet, and finally this flowing sea of indignant squalor, may they not give rise to occurrences? Behold, however, the twelve she deputies return from the chateau. Without President Meunier, indeed, but radiant with joy, shouting life to the king and his house. Apparently the news are good, madame. News of the best. Five of us were admitted to the internal splendors, to the royal presence. This slim damsel, Louis' own Chabray, worker in sculpture, aged only seventeen, as being of the best looks and address, her we appointed speaker. On whom, and indeed on all of us, His Majesty looked nothing but graciousness. Nay, when Louis' own, addressing him, was like to faint, he took her in his royal arms, and said gallantly, it was well worth while, L.N. valued bien la peine. Consider, O women, what a king! His words were of comfort, and that only, there shall be provision sent to Paris, if provision is in the world, grains shall circulate free as air, millers shall grind, or do worse, while their millstones endure, and nothing be left wrong which a restorer of French liberty can write. Good news these, but, to Whitman adds, all too incredible. There seems no proof, then? Words of comfort are words only, which will feed nothing. O oh, miserable people, betrayed by aristocrats, who corrupt thy very messengers. In his royal arms, Mademoiselle Louis' own? In his arms? Thou shameless minx, worthy of a name, that shall be nameless. Yes, thy skin is soft, ours is rough with hardship, and well wetted, waiting here in the rain. No children hast thou hungry at home, only alabaster dolls, that weep not. The traitress. To the lanterne. And so poor Louis' own Chabray, no asseveration or shrieks availing her, fair slim damsel, laid in the arms of royalty, has a garter round her neck, and furibund Amazons at each end, is about to perish so, when two bodyguards gallop up, indignantly dissipating, and rescue her. 
the miscredited twelve hastened back to the chateau, for an answer in writing. Nay, behold, a new flight of menads, with M. Brunout Bastille volunteer, as impressed commandant at the head of it. These also will advance to the great of the grand court, and see what is toward. Human patience, in wet buckskins, has its limits. Bodyguard Lieutenant, M. de Savaniers, for one moment, lets his temper, long provoked, long pent, give way. He not only dissipates these latter menads, but caracoles and cuts, or indignantly flourishes, at M. Brunout, the impressed commandant, and, finding great relief in it, even chases him, Brunout flying nimbly, though in a pirouette manner, and now with sword also drawn. At which sight of wrath and victory two other bodyguards, for wrath is contagious, and a pent bodyguards is so solacing, do likewise give way, give chase, with brandished sabre, and in the air make horrid circles. So that poor Brunout has nothing for it but to retreat with accelerated nimbleness, through rank after rank, Parthian-like, fencing as he flies, above all, shouting lustily, a new less assassiner, they are getting us assassinated? Shameful. Three against one. Growls come from the Lecointrian ranks, bellowings, lastly shots. Savanier's arm is raised to strike, the bullet of a Lecointrian musket shatters it, the brandished saber jingles down harmless. Brunout has escaped, this duel well ended, but the wild howl of war is everywhere beginning to pipe. The Amazons recoil, Saint Antoine has its cannon pointed, full of grape shot, thrice applies the lit flambeau, which thrice refuses to catch, the touch holes are so wetted, and voices cry, Arete, il ne pot temps encore, stop, it is not yet time. Messieurs of the Garde du Corps, he had orders not to fire, nevertheless two of you limp dismounted, and one warhorse lies slain. Were it not well to draw back out of shot range, finally to file off, into the interior? If in so filing off, there did a musketoon or two discharge itself, at these armed shopkeepers, hooting and crowing, could man wonder? Draggled are your white cockades of an enormous size, would to heaven they were got exchanged for tricolor ones. Your buckskins are wet, your heart's heavy. Go, and return not. The bodyguards file off, as we hint, giving and receiving shots, drawing no lifeblood, leaving boundless indignation. Some three times in the thickening dusk, a glimpse of them is seen at this or the other portal, saluted always with execrations, with a few of lead. Let but a bodyguard show face, he is hunted by rascality, for instance, poor M. de Machetin of the Scotch Company, owner of the slain warhorse, and has to be smuggled off by Versailles captains. Or rusty firelocks belch after him, shivering asunder his hat. In the end, by superior order, the bodyguards, all but the few on immediate duty, disappear, or as it were abscond, and march, under cloud of night, to Rambouillet. We remark also that the Versailles have now got ammunition, all afternoon, the official person could find none, till, in these so critical moments, a patriotic sub-lieutenant set a pistol to his ear, and would thank him to find some, which he thereupon succeeded in doing. Likewise that Flandre, disarmed by Pallas Athene, says openly, it will not fight with citizens, and for token of peace, has exchanged cartridges with the Versailles. Sansculottism is now among mere friends, and can circulate freely, indignant at bodyguards, complaining also considerably of hunger. Chapter 1.78. The Equal Diet. But why lingers Mounier, returns not with his deputation. It is six, it is seven o'clock, and still no Mounier, no acceptance pure and simple. And, behold, the dripping monads, not now in deputation but in mass, have penetrated into the assembly, to the shamefulest interruption of public speaking and order of the day. Neither Maillard nor vice-president can restrain them, except within wide limits, not even, except for minutes, can the lion voice of Mirabeau, though they applaud it, but ever and anon they break in upon the regeneration of France with cries of, bread, not so much discoursing. Dupain, pas tant de longs discours. So insensible were these poor creatures to bursts of parliamentary eloquence. One learns also that the royal carriages are getting yoked, as if for Metz. Carriages, royal or not, have verily showed themselves at the back gates. They even produced, or quoted, a written order from our Versailles municipality, which is a monarchic not a democratic one. However, Versailles patrols drove them in again, as the vigilant Lecoiner had strictly charged them to do. A busy man, truly, is Major Lecoiner, in these hours. For Colonel Disdain loiters invisible in the Ouy de Boeuf, invisible, or still more questionably visible, for instance, then also a too loyal municipality requires supervision, no order, civil or military, taken about any of these thousand things. Lee Coiner is at the Versailles Town Hall, he is at the grade of the Grand Court, communing with Swiss and bodyguards. He is in the ranks of Flandre, 
he is here, he is there, studious to prevent bloodshed, to prevent the royal family from flying to Metz, the Monads from plundering Versailles. At the fall of night, we behold him advance to those armed groups of Saint Antoine, hovering all too grim near the Salle des Menus. They receive him in a half circle, twelve speakers behind cannons, with lighted torches in hand, the cannon mouths towards Lee Coynter, a picture for Salvatore. He asks, in temperate but courageous language, what they, by this their journey to Versailles, do specially want? The twelve speakers reply, in few words inclusive of much, bread, and the end of these brabbles, do pain, at la fin des affairs. When the affairs will end, no major Lee Coiner, nor no mortal, can say, but as to bread, he inquires, how many are you? Learns that they are six hundred, that a loaf each will suffice, and rides off to the municipality to get six hundred loaves. Which loaves, however, a municipality of monarchic temper will not give. It will give two tons of rice rather, could you but know whether it should be boiled or raw. Nay when this too is accepted, the municipals have disappeared, ducked under, as the six and twenty long gown of Paris did, and, leaving not the smallest vestige of rice, in the boiled or raw state, they there vanish from history. Rice comes not, one's hope of food is balked, even one's hope of vengeance, is not M. De Machetin of the Scotch Company, as we said, deceitfully smuggled off? Failing all which, behold only M. De Machetin slain warhorse, lying on the esplanade there. Saint Antoine, balked, Assyrian, pounces on the slain warhorse, flays it, roasts it, with such fuel, of paling, gates, portable timber as can be come at, not without shouting, and, after the manner of ancient Greek heroes, they lifted their hands to the daintily readied repast, such as it might be. Other rascality prowls discursive, seeking what it may devour. Flandre will retire to its barracks, Lee Coiner also with his Versailles, all but the vigilant patrols, charged to be doubly vigilant. So sink the shadows of night, blustering, rainy, and all paths grow dark. Strangest night ever seen in these regions, perhaps since the Bartholomew night, when Versailles, as Bessompierre writes of it, was a Chetif chateau. Oh for the lyre of some Orpheus, to constrain, with touch of melodious strings, these mad masses into order. For here all seems fallen asunder, in wide yawning dislocation. The highest, as in down rushing of a world, is come in contact with the lowest, the rascality of France beleaguering the royalty of France, iron shod batons lifted round the diadem, not to guard it. With denunciations of bloodthirsty anti-national bodyguards, are heard dark growlings against a queenly name. The court sits tremulous, powerless, varies with the varying temper of the esplanade, with the varying color of the rumors from Paris. Thick coming rumors, now of peace, now of war. Necker and all the ministers consult, with a blank issue. The Uy de Boeuf is one tempest of whispers, we will fly to Metz, we will not fly. The royal carriages again attempt egress, though for trial merely, they are again driven in by Lee Coiner's patrols. In six hours, nothing has been resolved on, not even the acceptance pure and simple. In six hours? Alas, he who, in such circumstances, cannot resolve in six minutes, may give up the enterprise, him fate has already resolved for. And Menadism, meanwhile, and Sanskalatism takes counsel with the National Assembly, grows more and more tumultuous there. Meunier returns not, authority nowhere shows itself, the authority of France lies, for the present, with Lee Coiner and Usher Maillard. This then is the abomination of desolation, come suddenly, though long foreshadowed as inevitable. For, to the blind, all things are sudden. Misery which, through long ages, had no spokesman, no helper, will now be its own helper and speak for itself. The dialect, one of the rudest, is, what it could be, this. At eight o'clock there returns to our assembly not the deputation, but Dr. Guillotin announcing that it will return, also that there is hope of the acceptance pure and simple. He himself has brought a royal letter, authorizing and commanding the freest circulation of grains. Which royal letter menadism with its whole heart applauds? Conformably to which the assembly forthwith passes a decree, also received with rapturous monadic plaudits, only could not an august assembly contrive further to fix the price of bread at eight sous the half quarter, butchers meat at six sous the pound, which seem fair rates. Such motion do a multitude of men and women, irrepressible by Usher Maillard, now make, does an august assembly here made. Usher Maillard himself is not always perfectly measured in speech, but if rebuked, he can justly excuse himself by the peculiarity of the circumstances. But finally, this decree well passed, and the disorder continuing, and members melting away, and no President Mounier returning, what can the Vice President do but also melt away? The Assembly melts, under such pressure, into deliquium, or, as it is officially called, adjourns. Maillard is dispatched to Paris, 
with the decree concerning grains in his pocket, he and some women, in carriages belonging to the king. Thitherward Slim Louison Chabray has already set forth, with that written answer, which the twelve she deputies returned in to seek. Slim Sylph, she has set forth, through the black money country, she has much to tell, her poor nerves so flurried, and travels, as indeed today on this road all persons do, with extreme slowness. President Mounier has not come, nor the acceptance pure and simple, though six hours with their events have come, though courier on courier reports that Lafayette is coming. Coming, with war or with peace. It is time that the Chateau also should determine on one thing or another, that the Chateau also should show itself alive, if it would continue living. Victorious, joyful after such delay, Mounier does arrive at last, and the hard-earned acceptance with him, which now, alas, is of small value. Fancy Mounier's surprise to find his Senate, whom he hoped to charm by the acceptance pure and simple, all gone, and in its stead a Senate of Menads. For as Erasmus's ape mimicked, say with wooden splint, Erasmus shaving, so do these Amazons hold, in mock majesty, some confused parody of national assembly. They make motions, deliver speeches, pass enactments, productive at least of loud laughter. All galleries and benches are filled, a strong dame of the market is in Mounier's chair. Not without difficulty, Mounier, by aid of massers, and persuasive speaking, makes his way to the female president, the strong dame before abdicating signifies that, for one thing, she and indeed her whole senate male and female, for what was one roasted war horse among so many? Are suffering very considerably from hunger. Experienced Mounier, in these circumstances, takes a twofold resolution, to reconvoke his assembly members by sound of drum, also to procure a supply of food. Swift messengers fly, to all bakers, cooks, pastry cooks, vintners, restorers, drums beat, accompanied with shrill vocal proclamation, through all streets. They come, the assembly members come, what is still better, the provisions come. On tray and barrow come these latter, loaves, wine, great store of sausages. The nourishing baskets circulate harmoniously along the benches, nor, according to the father of epics, did any soul lack a fair share of vittle, delta alpha tau omicron sigma sigma eta sigma, an equal diet, highly desirable, at the moment. Gradually some hundred or so of assembly members get edged in, menadism making way a little, round Mounier's chair, listen to the acceptance pure and simple, and begin, what is the order of the night, discussion of the penal code. All benches are crowded, in the dusky galleries, duskier with unwashed heads, is a strange coruscation, of impromptu billhooks. It is exactly five months this day since these same galleries were filled with high-plumed jeweled beauty, raining bright influences, and now? To such length have we got in regenerating France. Methinks the travail throws are of the sharpest. Menadism will not be restrained from occasional remarks, asks, what is use of the penal code? The thing we want is bread. Mirabeau turns round with lion-voiced rebuke, Menadism applauds him, but recommences. Thus they, chewing tough sausages, discussing the penal code, make night hideous. What the issue will be? Lafayette with his thirty thousand must arrive first, him, who cannot now be distant, all men expect, as the messenger of destiny. Chapter 1.79. Lafayette. Towards midnight lights flare on the hill, Lafayette's lights. The roll of his drums comes up the avenue de Versailles. With peace, or with war? Patience, friends. With neither. Lafayette has come, but not yet the catastrophe. He has halted and harangued so often, on the march, spent nine hours on four leagues of road. At Montreuil, close on Versailles, the whole host had to pause, and, with uplifted right hand, in the murk of night, to these pouring skies, swear solemnly to respect the king's dwelling, to be faithful to king and national assembly. Rage is driven down out of sight, by the laggard march, the thirst of vengeance slaked in weariness and soaking clothes. Flandre is again drawn out under arms, but Flandre, grown so patriotic, now needs no exterminating. The wayworn battalions halt in the avenue, they have, for the present, no wish so pressing as that of shelter and rest. Anxious sits President Mounier, anxious the chateau. There is a message coming from the chateau, that M. Mounier would please return thither with a fresh deputation, swiftly, and so at least unite our two anxieties. Anxious Mounier does of himself send, meanwhile, to apprise the general that His Majesty has been so gracious as to grant us the acceptance pure and simple. The general, with a small advance column, makes answer in passing, speaks vaguely some smooth words to the national president, glances, only with the eye, at that so mixed to form national assembly, then fares forward towards the chateau. There are with him two Paris municipals, they were chosen from the three hundred for that errand. He gets admittance through the locked and padlocked grates, through sentries and ushers, to the royal halls. 
the court, male and female, crowds on his passage, to read their doom on his face, which exhibits, say historians, a mixture of sorrow, of fervor and valor, singular to behold. The king, with monsieur, with ministers and marshals, is waiting to receive him, he is come, in his high-flown chivalrous way, to offer his head for the safety of his majesties. The two municipals state the wish of Paris, four things, of quite pacific tenor. First, that the honor of guarding his sacred person be conferred on Patriot National Guards, say, the center grenadiers, who as Garda Frances were wont to have that privilege. Second, that provisions be got, if possible. Third, that the prisons, all crowded with political delinquents, may have judges sent them. Fourth, that it would please His Majesty to come and live in Paris. To all which four wishes, except the fourth, His Majesty answers readily, yes, or indeed may almost say that he has already answered it. To the fourth he can answer only, yes or no, would so gladly answer, yes and no. But, in any case, are not their dispositions, thank heaven, so entirely pacific? There is time for deliberation. The brunt of the danger seems past. Lafayette and Destain settle the watches, center grenadiers are to take the guardroom they have old occupied as Garda Frances, for indeed the Garda du Corps, its late ill-advised occupants, are gone mostly to Rambouillet. That is the order of this night, sufficient for the night is the evil thereof. Whereupon Lafayette and the two municipals, with high-flown chivalry, take their leave. So brief has the interview been, Mounier and his deputation were not yet got up. So brief and satisfactory. A stone is rolled from every heart. The fair palace dames publicly declare that this Lafayette, detestable though he be, is their saviour for once. Even the ancient vinegarous taunts admit it. The king's aunts, ancient grail and sisterhood, known to us of old. Queen Marie Antoinette has been heard often say the like. She alone, among all women and all men, wore a face of courage, of lofty calmness and resolve, this day. She alone saw clearly what she meant to do, and Teresa's daughter dares do what she means, were all France threatening her, abide where her children are, where her husband is. Towards three in the morning all things are settled, the watch is set, the center grenadiers put into their old guardroom, and harangued, the Swiss and few remaining bodyguards harangued. The wayworn Paris battalions, consigned to the hospitality of Versailles, lie dormant in spare beds, spare barracks, coffee houses, empty churches. A troop of them, on their way to the church of Saint Louis, awoke poor Weber, dreaming troublous, in the Rue Sartory. Weber has had his waistcoat pocket full of balls all day, two hundred balls, and two pairs of powder. For waistcoats were waistcoats then, and had flaps down to mid thigh. So many balls he has had all day, but no opportunity of using them, he turns over now execrating disloyal bandits, swears a prayer or two, and straight to sleep again. Finally, the National Assembly is harangued, which thereupon, on motion of Mirabeau, discontinues the penal code, and dismisses for this night. Menadism, sans galotism has cowered into guardhouses, barracks of Flandre, to the light of cheerful fire, failing that, to churches, office houses, sentry boxes, wheresoever wretchedness can find a lair. The troublous day has brawled itself to rest, no lives yet lost but that of one war horse. Insurrectionary chaos lies slumbering round the palace, like ocean round a diving bell, no crevice yet disclosing itself. Deep sleep has fallen promiscuously on the high and on the low, suspending most things, even wrath and famine. Darkness covers the earth. But, far on the northeast, Paris flings up her great yellow gleam, far into the wet black night. For all is illuminated there, as in the old July nights, the streets deserted, for alarm of war, the municipals all wakeful, patrols hailing, with their horse who goes. There, as we discover, our poor slim Louis own Chevray, her poor nerves all fluttered, is arriving about this very hour. Their usher Maillard will arrive, about an hour hence, towards four in the morning. They report, successively, to a wakeful hotel de ville what comfort they can report, which again, with early dawn, large comfortable placards, shall impart to all men. Lafayette, in the Hotel de Noailles, not far from the Chateau, having now finished haranguing, sits with his officers consulting, at five o'clock the unanimous best counsel is, that a man so toast and toiled for twenty-four hours and more, fling himself on a bed, and seek some rest. Thus, then, has ended the first act of the insurrection of women. How it will turn on the morrow? The morrow, as always, is with the fates. But His Majesty, one may hope, will consent to come honorably to Paris, at all events, he can visit Paris. Anti-national bodyguards, here and elsewhere, must take the national oath, make reparation to the tricolor, Flandre will swear. There may be much swearing, much public speaking there will infallibly be, and so, with harangues and vows, 
may the matter in some handsome way, wind itself up. Or, alas, may it not be all otherwise, unhandsome, the consent not honourable, but extorted, ignominious? Boundless chaos of insurrection presses slumbering round the palace, like ocean round a diving bell, and may penetrate at any crevice. Let but that accumulated insurrectionary mass find entrance. Like the infinite inburst of water, or say rather, of inflammable, self-igniting fluid, for example, turpentine and phosphorus oil, fluid known to Spinola Santerre. Chapter 1.7.x. The Grand Entries. The dull dawn of a new morning, drizzly and chill, had but broken over Versailles, when it pleased destiny that a bodyguard should look out of window, on the right wing of the chateau, to see what prospect there was in heaven and in earth. Rascality male and female is prowling in view of him. His fasting stomach is, with good cause, sour, he perhaps cannot forbear a passing mollison on them, least of all can he forbear answering such. Ill words breed worse, till the worst word came, and then the ill deed. Did the maledicent bodyguard, getting, as was too inevitable, better malediction than he gave, load his musketoon, and threaten to fire, and actually fire? Were wives who wist. It stands asserted, to us not credibly. Be this as it may, menaced rascality, in whinnying scorn, is shaking at all greats, the fastening of one, some right, it was a chain merely, gives way, rascality is in the grand court, winning louder still. The maledicent bodyguard, more bodyguards than he do now give fire, a man's arm is shattered. Lee Coiner will depose that the Sieur Cardin, a national guard without arms, was stabbed. But see, sure enough, poor Jerome Laretier, an unarmed national guard he too, cabinet maker, a saddler's son, of Paris, with the down of youthhood still on his chin, he reels death-stricken, rushes to the pavement, scattering it with his blood and brains. Alleluia. Wilder than Irish wakes, rises the howl, of pity, of infinite revenge. In few moments, the great of the inner and inmost court, which they name court of marble, this too is forced, or surprised, and burst open, the court of marble too is overflowed, up the grand staircase, up all stairs and entrances rushes the living deluge. Deschutz and Varigny, the two sentry bodyguards, are trodden down, are massacred with a hundred pikes. Women snatch their cutlasses, or any weapon, and storm in men attic. Other women lift the corpse of Shot Jerome, lay it down on the marble steps, there shall the livid face and smashed head, dumb forever, speak. Woe now to all bodyguards, mercy is none for them. Mia Mandre de Saint Marie pleads with soft words, on the grand staircase, descending four steps, to the roaring tornado. His comrades snatch him up, by the skirts and belts, literally, from the jaws of destruction, and slam to their door. This also will stand few instants, the panel shivering in, like pots herds. Barricading serves not, fly fast, ye bodyguards, rabid insurrection, like the hellhound chase, uproaring at your heels. The terror-struck bodyguards fly, bolting and barricading, it follows. Witherward? Through hall on hall, woe, now. Towards the queen's suite of rooms, in the furtherest room of which the queen is now asleep. Five sentinels rush through that long suite, they are in the anteroom knocking loud, save the queen. Trembling women fall at their feet with tears, are answered, yes, we will die, save ye the queen. Tremble not, women, but haste, for, lo, another voice shouts far through the outermost door, save the queen. And the door shut. It is brave Miamandre's voice that shouts this second warning. He has stormed across imminent death to do it, fronts imminent death, having done it. Brave Tartavet du repair, bent on the same desperate service, was borne down with pikes, his comrades hardly snatched him in again alive. Miamandre and Tartavet, let the names of these two bodyguards, as the names of brave men should, live long. Trembling maids of honour, one of whom from afar caught glimpse of Miamandre as well as heard him, hastily wrap the queen, not in robes of state. She flies for her life, across the Uy de Boeuf, against the main door of which two insurrection batters. She is in the king's apartment, in the king's arms, she clasps her children amid a faithful few. The imperial hearted bursts into mother's tears, O oh my friends, save me and my children, O oh mess amis, sauvez moi et mess infants. The battering of insurrectionary axes clangs audible across the Uy de Boeuf. What an hour! Yes, friends, a hideous fearful hour, shameful alike to governed and governor, wherein governed and governor ignominiously testify that their relation is at an end. Rage, which had brewed itself in twenty thousand hearts, for the last four and twenty hours, has taken fire, Jerome's brained corpse lies there as live coal. It is, as we said, the infinite element bursting in, wild surging through all corridors and conduits. Meanwhile, the poor bodyguards have got hunted mostly into the Uy de Boeuf. 
They may die there, at the king's threshold, they can do little to defend it. They are heaping taborets, stools of honor, benches and all movables, against the door, at which the axe of insurrection thunders. But did brave Miamondre perish, then, at the queen's door? No, he was fractured, slashed, lacerated, left for dead, he has nevertheless crawled hither, and shall live, honored of loyal France. Remark also, in flat contradiction to much which has been said and sung, that insurrection did not burst that door he had defended, but hurried elsewhither, seeking new bodyguards. Poor bodyguards, with their Thyestes opera repast. Well for them, that insurrection has only pikes and axes, no right sieging tools. It shakes and thunders. Must they all perish miserably, and royalty with them? Deschutes and Varigny, massacred at the first inbreak, have been beheaded in the marble court, a sacrifice to Jerome's manies, Jordan with the tile beard did that duty willingly, and asked, if there were no more? Another captive they are leading round the corpse, with howl chauntings, may not Jordan again tuck up his sleeves? And louder and louder rages insurrection within, plundering if it cannot kill, louder and louder it thunders at the Uy de Boeuf, what can now hinder its bursting in? On a sudden it ceases, the battering has ceased. Wild rushing, the cries grow fainter, there is silence, or the tramp of regular steps, then a friendly knocking, we are the centre grenadiers, old guard of France says, open to us, messieurs of the guard du corps, we have not forgotten how you saved us at Fontenoy. The door is opened, enter Captain Gondron and the centre grenadiers, there are military embracings, there is sudden deliverance from death into life. Strange sons of Adam. It was to exterminate these guard du corps that the centre grenadiers left home, and now they have rushed to save them from extermination. The memory of common peril, of old help, melts the rough heart. Bosom is clasped to bosom, not in war. The king shows himself, one moment, through the door of his apartment, with, Do not hurt my guards! Exclamation mark my own frere, let us be brothers. Cries Captain Gondron, and again dashes off, with leveled bayonets, to sweep the palace clear. Now to Lafayette, suddenly roused, not from sleep, for his eyes had not yet closed, arrives, with passionate popular eloquence, with prompt military word of command. National guards, suddenly roused, by sound of trumpet and alarm drum, are all arriving. The death melee ceases, the first sky lambent blaze of insurrection is got damped down, it burns now, if unextinguished, yet flameless, as charred coals do, and not inextinguishable. The king's apartments are safe. Ministers, officials, and even some loyal national deputies are assembling round their majesties. The consternation will, with sobs and confusion, settle down gradually, into plan and council, better or worse but glance now, for a moment, from the royal windows. A roaring sea of human heads, inundating both courts, billowing against all passages, monadic women, infuriated men, mad with revenge, with love of mischief, love of plunder. Rascality has slipped its muzzle, and now bays, three-throated, like the dog of Erebus. Fourteen bodyguards are wounded, two massacred, and as we saw, beheaded, Jordan asking, was it worthwhile to come so far for two? Hapless Deschutes and Varigny their fate surely was sad. Whirled down so suddenly to the abyss, as men are, suddenly, by the wide thunder of the mountain avalanche, awakened not by them, awakened far off by others. When the chateau clock last struck, they too were pacing languid, with poised musketoon, anxious mainly that the next hour would strike. It has struck, to them inaudible. Their trunks lie mangled, their heads parade, on pikes twelve feet long, through the streets of Versailles, and shall, about noon reach the barriers of Paris, a too ghastly contradiction to the large comfortable placards that have been posted there. The other captive bodyguard is still circling the corpse of Jerome, amid Indian war whooping, bloody tile beard, with tucked sleeves, brandishing his bloody axe, when Gondron and the grenadiers come in sight. Comrades, will you see a man massacred in cold blood? Question mark off, butchers. Answer they, and the poor bodyguard is free. Busy runs Gondron, busy run guards and captains, scouring at all corridors, dispersing rascality and robbery, sweeping the palace clear. The mangled carnage is removed, Jerome's body to the town hall, for inquest, the fire of insurrection gets damped, more and more, into measurable, manageable heat. Transcendent things of all sorts, as in the general outburst of multitudinous passion, are huddled together, the ludicrous, nay the ridiculous, with the horrible. Far over the billowy sea of heads, may be seen rascality, capreeling on horses from the royal stud. The spoilers these, for patriotism is always infected so, with a proportion of mere thieves and scoundrels. Gondron snatched their prey from them in the chateau, whereupon they hurried to the stables, and took horse there. 
but the generous Diomedes steeds, according to Weber, disdained such scoundrel burden, and, flinging up their royal heels, did soon project most of it, in parabolic curves, to a distance, amid peals of laughter, and were caught. Mounted National Guards secured the rest. Now too is witness the touching last flicker of etiquette, which sinks not here, in the Sumerian world wreckage, without a sign, as the house cricket might still chirp in the pealing of a trump of doom. Monsieur, said some master of ceremonies, one hopes it might be de Brézé, as Lafayette, in these fearful moments, was rushing towards the inner royal apartments, Monsieur, la roi vous accorde les grands entrées, Monsieur, the king grants you the grand entries, comma, not finding it convenient to refuse them. Chapter 1.711. From Versailles. However, the Paris National Guard, wholly under arms, has cleared the palace, and even occupies the nearer external spaces, extruding miscellaneous patriotism, for most part, into the grand court, or even into the forecourt. The bodyguards, you can observe, have now of a verity, hoisted the national cockade, for they step forward to the windows or balconies, hat aloft in hand, on each hat a huge tricolor, and fling over their bandoliers in sign of surrender, and shout vive la nation. To which how can the generous heart respond but with, vive la roi, vive les gardes du corps? His Majesty himself has appeared with Lafayette on the balcony, and again appears, vive la roi greets him from all throats, but also from some one throat is heard la roi à Paris, the king to Paris. Her Majesty too, on demand, shows herself, though there is peril in it, she steps out on the balcony, with her little boy and girl. No children, point in fans. Cry the voices. She gently pushes back her children, and stands alone her hands serenely crossed on her breast, should I die, she had said, I will do it. Such serenity of heroism has its effect. Lafayette, with ready wit, in his high-flown chivalrous way, takes that fair queenly hand, and reverently kneeling, kisses it, thereupon the people do shout vive la reine. Nevertheless, poor Weber saw, or even thought he saw, for hardly the third part of poor Weber's experiences, in such hysterical days, will stand scrutiny. One of these brigands level his musket at Her Majesty, with or without intention to shoot, for another of the brigands angrily struck it down. So that all, and the Queen herself, nay the very captain of the bodyguards, have grown national. The very captain of the bodyguards steps out now with Lafayette. On the hat of the repentant man is an enormous tricolor, large as a soup platter, or sunflower, visible to the utmost forecourt. He takes the national oath with a loud voice, elevating his hat, at which sight all the army raise their bonnets on their bayonets, with shouts. Sweet is reconcilement to the heart of man. Lafayette has sworn Flandre, he swears the remaining bodyguards, down in the marble court, the people clasp them in their arms, oh, my brothers, why would ye force us to slay you? Behold there is joy over you, as over returning prodigal sons. The poor bodyguards, now national and tricolor, exchange bonnets, exchange arms, there shall be peace and fraternity. And still vive la roi, and also la roi à Paris, not now from one throat, but from all throats is one, for it is the heart's wish of all mortals. Yes, the king to Paris, what else? Ministers may consult, and national deputies wag their heads, but there is now no other possibility. You have forced him to go willingly. At one o'clock. Lafayette gives audible assurance to that purpose, and universal insurrection, with immeasurable shout and a discharge of all the firearms, clear and rusty, great and small, that it has, returns him acceptance. What a sound, heard for leagues, a doom peal. That sound too rolls away, into the silence of ages. And the Chateau of Versailles stands ever since vacant, hushed still, its spacious courts grass-grown, responsive to the hoe of the weeder. Times and generations roll on, in their confused gulf current, and buildings like builders have their destiny. Till one o'clock, then, there will be three parties, National Assembly, National Rascality, National Royalty, all busy enough. Rascality rejoices, women trim themselves with tricolor. Nay motherly Paris has sent her avengers sufficient cartloads of loaves, which are shouted over, which are gratefully consumed. The avengers, in return, are searching for grain stores, loading them in fifty wagons, that so a national king, probable harbinger of all blessings, may be the evident bringer of plenty, for one. And thus has Sanskaladism made prisoner its king, revoking his parole. The monarchy has fallen, and not so much as honorably, no, ignominiously, with struggle, indeed, oft repeated, but then with unwise struggle, wasting its strength in fits and paroxysms, at every new paroxysm, foiled more pitifully than before. Thus broke Lee's whiff of grapeshot, which might have been something, has dwindled to the pot valor of an opera repast, and O oh Richard, O oh mon ROI. Which again we shall see dwindle to a favorous conspiracy, 
a thing to be settled by the hanging of one chevalier. For monarchy. But what safe foulest defeat can await that man, who wills, and yet wills not? Apparently the king either has a right, assertable as such to the death, before God and man, or else he has no right. Apparently, the one or the other, could he but know which. May heaven pity him. Were Louis wise he would this day abdicate. Is it not strange so few kings abdicate, and none yet heard of has been known to commit suicide? Fritz I, of Prussia, alone tried it, and they cut the rope. As for the National Assembly, which decrees this morning that it is inseparable from His Majesty, and will follow him to Paris, there may one thing be noted, its extreme one of bodily health. After the 14th of July there was a certain sickliness observable among honourable members, so many demanding passports, on account of infirm health. But now, for these following days, there is a perfect Murian, President Mounier, Lolly Tallendal, Claremont Tonnerre, and all constitutional two-chamber royalists needing change of air, as most no-chamber royalists had formerly done. For, in truth, it is the second emigration this that has now come, most extensive among commons deputies, noblesse, clergy, so that to Switzerland alone there go sixty thousand. They will return in the day of accounts. Yes, and have hot welcome. But emigration on emigration is the peculiarity of France. One emigration follows another, grounded on reasonable fear, unreasonable hope, largely also on childish pet. The high flyers have gone first, now the lower flyers, and ever the lower will go down to the crawlers. Whereby, however, cannot our National Assembly so much the more commodiously make the Constitution, your two-chamber Anglomaniacs being all safe, distant on foreign shores? Abbe Mori is seized, and sent back again, he, tough as tanned leather, with eloquent Captain Cazales and some others, will stand it out for another year. But here, meanwhile, the question arises, was Philippe d'Orléans seen, this day, in the Bois de Boulogne, in grace or two, waiting under the wet sere foliage, what the day might bring forth? Alas, yes, the adolin of him was, in Weber's and other such brains. The Châtelet shall make large inquisition into the matter, examining a hundred and seventy witnesses, and Deputy Chabroud publish his report, but disclose nothing farther. What then has caused these two unparalleled October days? For surely such dramatic exhibition never yet enacted itself without dramatist and machinist. Wooden punch emerges not, with his domestic sorrows, into the light of day, unless the wire be pulled, how can human mobs? Was it not Dorleon then, and Locklo, Marquis Sillery, Mirabeau and the Sons of Confusion, hoping to drive the king to Metz, and gather the spoil? Nay was it not, quite contrarywise, the Uy de Boeuf, bodyguard Colonel de Guiche, Minister Saint Priest and high-flying loyalists, hoping also to drive him to Metz, and try it by the sword of civil war? Good Marquis to Longin, the historian and deputy, feels constrained to admit that it was both. Alas, my friends, credulous incredulity is a strange matter. But when a whole nation is smitten with suspicion, and sees a dramatic miracle in the very operation of the gastric juices, what help is there? Such nation is already a mere hypochondriac bundle of diseases, as good as changed into glass, atrabiliar, decadent, and will suffer crises. Is not suspicion itself the one thing to be suspected, as Montaigne feared only fear? Now, however, the short hour has struck. His Majesty is in his carriage, with his queen, sister Elizabeth, and two royal children. Not for another hour can the infinite procession get marshalled, and under way. The weather is dim-drizzling, the mind confused, and noise great. Processional marches not a few our world has seen, Roman triumphs and ovations, cabarique symbol beatings, royal progresses, Irish funerals, but this of the French monarchy marching to its bed remained to be seen. Miles long, and of breadth losing itself in vagueness, for all the neighbouring country crowds to see. Slow, stagnating along, like shoreless lake, yet with a noise like Niagara, like Babel and Bedlam. A splashing and a tramping, a hurrahing, a proaring, musket volleying, the truest segment of chaos seen in these latter ages. Till slowly it disembogue itself, in the thickening dusk, into expectant Paris, through a double row of faces all the way from Passy to the Hôtel de Ville. Consider this, vanguard of national troops, with trains of artillery, of pikemen and pikewomen, mounted on cannons, on carts, hackney coaches, or on foot, tripudiating, in tricolor ribbons from head to heel, loaves stuck on the points of bayonets, green boughs stuck in gun barrels. Next, as main march, fifty cartloads of corn, which have been lent, for peace, from the stores of Versailles. Behind which follow stragglers of the Garde du Corps, all humiliated, in grenadier bonnets. Close on these comes the royal carriage, come royal carriages, for there are an hundred national deputies too, among whom sits Mirabeau, his remarks not given. Then finally, Pelmel, as rearguard, 
Flandre, Swiss, Hundred Swiss, other bodyguards, brigands, whosoever cannot get before. Between and among all which masses, flows without limit Saint Antoine, and the monadic cohort. Monadic especially about the royal carriage, tripudiating there, covered with tricolor, singing elusive songs, pointing with one hand to the royal carriage, which the illusions hit, and pointing to the provision wagons, with the other hand, and these words, courage, friends. We shall not want bread now, we are bringing you the baker, the bakeress, and baker's boy, la boulanger, la boulanger, at la petit mitron. The wit day draggles the tricolor, but the joy is unextinguishable. Is not all well now? Ah, madam, noter bon rain, said some of these strong women some days hence, ah madam, our good queen, don't be a traitor any more, ni soyez plus traitre, and we will all love you. Poor Weber went splashing along, close by the royal carriage, with a tear in his eye, their majesties did me the honour, or I thought they did it, to testify, from time to time, by shrugging of the shoulders, by looks directed to heaven, the emotions they felt. Thus, like frail cockle, floats the royal lifeboat, helmless, on black deluges of rascality. Mercier, in his loose way, estimates the procession and assistance at two hundred thousand. He says it was one boundless inarticulate ha-ha, transcendent world laughter, comparable to the Saturnalia of the ancients. Why not? Here too, as we said, is human nature once more human, shudder it at whoso is of shuddering humour, yet behold it is human. It has swallowed all formulas, it repudiates even so. For which reason they that collect vases and antiques, with figures of dancing bacchants in wild and all but impossible positions, may look with some interest on it. Thus, however, has the slow-moving chaos or modern Saturnalia of the ancients, reached the barrier, and must halt, to be harangued by Mayor Bailly. Thereafter it has to lumber along, between the double row of faces, in the transcendent heaven lashing ha-ha, two hours longer, towards the Hôtel de Ville. Then again to be harangued there, by several persons, by Moreau de Saint Mary, among others, Moreau of the Three Thousand Orders, now national deputy for Saint Domingo. To all which poor Louis, who seemed to experience a slight emotion on entering this town hall, can answer only that he comes with pleasure, with confidence among his people. Mayor Bailly, in reporting it, forgets confidence, and the poor queen says eagerly, add, with confidence. Messieurs, rejoins Bailly, you are happier than if I had not forgot. Finally, the king is shown on an upper balcony, by torchlight, with a huge tricolor in his hat, and all the people, says Weber, grasped one another's hands, thinking now surely the new era was born. Hardly till eleven at night can royalty get to its vacant, long deserted palace of the Tuileries, to lodge there, somewhat in strolling player fashion. It is Tuesday, the 6th of October, 1789. Poor Louis has two other Paris processions to make, one ludicrous ignominious like this, the other not ludicrous nor ignominious, but serious, nay sublime. End of the first volume.